scientists have thought for a while now that there may be water trapped within the Earth's mantle. Yeah, a secret ocean underneath our oceans inside the Earth. This would change our common understanding of what the Earth looks like on the inside. And now there's new evidence that provides even more support for this idea, and that has geoscientists of all kinds wondering how Earth's hidden oceans could have formed. And get this, the new evidence? It's diamonds. Back in 2014, scientists discovered diamonds that contain water-bearing minerals. These diamonds were brought up into human range from deep within the Earth's transition zone, around 640 kilometers below the Earth's surface. So this was pretty remarkable. I mean, how did water get trapped in something that far down? Well, when we're talking about water here, we're not talking about the liquid water that we're familiar with. It's actually the different elements that make up water, hydrogen and oxygen, bound into the crystalline structure of a solid mineral, which is where we get the term water-bearing minerals. See, the Earth's mantle moves by convection, meaning that hot magma rises and pushes other parts of the mantle down further into the Earth. When these water-bearing minerals get pushed down because of this convection activity, the increased pressure literally wrings the water out of them, this time as water we would probably recognize. The initial conjecture that there may be some water deep within the Earth was confirmed by the 2014 diamond discovery, and then backed up with seismic data. The seismic readings were consistent with the idea that there was water in the mantle and that it contributes to the mantle's behavior. But more recently, even more diamonds! These new jewels pulled up from the Earth's depths actually do contain water, but in a totally new form that we've never observed before. These diamonds from several locations across Southern Africa and China contain tiny inclusions of a form of water called Ice 7, an extremely high pressure form of water that scientists referred to as water ice. This is the first time we've ever actually observed this form of water in nature. The researchers say these new diamonds support the presence of at least what they're calling aqueous pockets of water throughout the mantle. So not only is there water definitely inside the Earth, but also it may be in a totally novel form of water that we've never observed in nature before. I feel like that leads us to two important questions. So what? And how did it get there? Well, one answer kind of addresses both. The main theory for how we have water on Earth at all is that it got brought to us by rogue asteroids containing water-bearing minerals crashing into us from the far reaches of our solar system. The theory goes that when the Earth was forming, our solar system was probably too hot for any water molecules to survive and cling to the space dust that would become the Earth. So water had to have been brought to us from off-planet after the Earth formed. But these new diamonds could upend that. Some scientists now estimate that the mantle might contain more water than all of the Earth's surface oceans combined, which is way more water than could have been pulled via convection from the surface of the Earth into the mantle in the given time frame. We may need to re-examine our theories about the state of the solar system at the time the Earth was forming. Maybe it was possible for water to survive and cling to dust and rock as it coalesced to form the Earth. Maybe there's an entirely different theory that we haven't thought of yet. We're still unsure of the exact amount of water in the mantle or what form it might be in. Scientists plan to keep exploring, though, both with seismic measurements and lab experiments that try to simulate the materials and pressures that we would find inside the Earth. And, of course, looking for and examining diamonds. Not the kind that you would put in a ring, but, of course, the kind that contain hydrous minerals, a girl's true best friend. Fun fact, the materials that primarily make up the Earth's mantle are called Wadsleyite and Ringwoodite, both water-bearing minerals whose structure leaves them prone to gapping, letting researchers think of them a bit like a sponge that's holding the mantle's water. For more awesome Earth science, subscribe to Seeker and check out this video here about the massive asteroid currently headed for Earth. Thanks for watching. Unlike every other planet in our solar system, Earth's surface is 70% liquid water, which while useful for life is also kind of weird, because everything we know about how and when our planet formed says Earth's surface should be bone dry. The story goes like this. Our solar system formed from the collapse of a large cloud of dust and gas. The dense blob of gas at the center ignited to form the sun, which as a young, unstable star unleashed a fierce solar wind. Over time, this stream of charged particles pushed the remaining gas cloud farther and farther out, leaving only solid particles behind to clump together into rocks, planetesimals, and finally, the rocky planets of the inner solar system that we know today. And here's the problem. Water, in the form of ice, couldn't have been one of the solid particles that stuck around to form our planet, because the early inner solar system was far too hot for frozen water, and any water vapor would have been blasted away by the solar wind. So if Earth didn't start off with water, how did we end up with such splendid oceans? 
we know H2O wasn't manufactured here over the eons, because natural processes like combustion, breathing, and photosynthesis create and destroy roughly equal amounts of water. And either way, the amounts in question are so minuscule that they can't account for the abundance of water on the planet. Since Earth's water was neither part of the original package nor manufactured here, it must have flown in from far away, on meteoroids or comets or other bodies originating in the outer solar system where they were far enough from the sun for frozen water to survive. The dirty ice balls we call comets are a logical candidate for the source of our water, but were ruled out when we discovered that they were far richer in heavy hydrogen than Earth water. Heavy hydrogen has a neutron as well as a proton in its nucleus, and for every million hydrogen atoms in Earth water, about 150 are heavy ones, while typical comet water has twice that many. These mismatched chemical signatures suggest that Earth's water couldn't have arrived on comets. It turns out that the most likely source for Earth's water is a type of meteorite called a carbonaceous chondrite. Chondrite is just the name given to the class of stony meteoroids that most commonly strike the Earth but only the carbonaceous chondrites contain water, as well as lots of carbon if you couldn't tell from their name. They have water in them because they formed out beyond the sun's frost line. And what's more, their water has levels of heavy hydrogen similar to that of earth water, strongly suggesting that these earth crashers are the source of our ice caps, clouds, rivers, and oceans. And thus the water that turned our planet into a blue marble came quite literally out of the blue. Our next experiment embraces one of the most dangerous forces of nature. Almost four million people have watched red hot lava meet ice. We caught up with artist Bobby Saki and geologist Jeff Carson and their rumbling lava furnace to ask them what they thought would happen. I had no idea what it was gonna do. No idea at all. The first guess is always it's going to explode. Blow. Always number one. Or it's going to tunnel down. It's just going to dig right through the ice, melt a hole in the ice. And of course, it didn't do any of those things. I was stunned by what it did when it hit the ice. And you see the bubbles, you know, bubbles this big, and then there's bubbles within bubbles. The scrambled eggs from hell uh, is the way it looks in that video. It just did things we just didn't really expect. So why are volcanic bubbles formed? The lava is so hot that when it's poured onto the ice, the ice instantly turns not just into water, but straight into steam. Now this steam has to escape, so it bubbles through the lava. So while it looks like the lava itself is boiling, it's actually the steam being produced that is trying to escape. As the lava cools, we start to get a thick black layer forming on top, and this starts to trap those bubbles of superheated steam inside the rock, and it's kind of like a natural form of glass blowing. But how does the lava crawl across the ice? Shouldn't it melt right through? The formation of all of this steam helps the lava to flow because it means that it's sitting on top of a blanket of steam rather than in contact with the ice itself. And this means the friction between the lava and the ice surface is very low. Now Bob and Jeff are taking things to the next level. It's lava versus water. Wow. We've done over 100 pours into water, onto ice, onto sand, onto snow. We're learning a lot. There are things that are happening here that we had not anticipated. It's beautiful stuff. Stand back. That sputtering lava is over 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Welcome to the Earth of four billion years ago. This was our planet before life. Nobody knows how life got started. Most of the evidence from that time was destroyed by impacts and erosion. Science works on the frontier between knowledge and ignorance. We're not afraid to admit what we don't know. There's no shame in that. The only shame is to pretend that we have all the answers. Maybe someone watching this will be the first to solve the mystery of how life on Earth began. The Earth and the Moon 
were born together. And they have dramatically shaped each other's evolution. Now, we think that life was also given a head start by the presence of our oversized moon. This is the Earth 4.4 billion years ago, around the time scientists think life on Earth got started. The newly formed moon sits just 15,000 miles away, appearing much larger in the sky than it does today. Its gravity raises enormous tides in the Earth's warm, young oceans. In that era, the tides were not measured in feet, they were measured in miles. You'd have these massive tsunamis that would wash up on land and then wash back into the sea. The moon's gravity creates tides by drawing Earth's oceans up toward it in a bulge of water. And as the Earth spins, this bulge washes onto land as a tide. The closer the moon, the bigger the pull of gravity and the stronger the tide. Some scientists think that the warm rock pools these giant early tides left behind formed the perfect mixing bowl for the ingredients of life to come together. The good thing about a tidal pond is that environments change. Water comes in, brings nutrients, goes away, the nutrients concentrate. So that may have been a process that concentrated the stuff life needed in a way that led to life. Four point four billion years ago, on rushing tides stir up organic molecules from the surface of the Earth. As the tides recede, these chemicals are left behind in shallow rock pools, which then evaporate in the heat of the sun, concentrating down their chemical contents. Perhaps the first life was born inside this rich organic soup. If we had tiny little moons around the Earth like Mars does, then we never would have had the massive tides that carry materials and energy up onto the beach environment where life really might have gotten a foothold. And, and so we wouldn't have had the minerals, we wouldn't have had the energy, and maybe we wouldn't have had life. Did the moon create life on Earth? The jury's still out. But one thing's for certain, intelligent life takes time to evolve. In our case, at least four billion years. We've gradually changed from simple, single cells to the kind of organism that can question its own origins. And it's the moon that's provided the stability for life to evolve by holding the Earth's axial tilt steady for over four billion years. The origin of life on Earth is complicated, and no one really knows exactly how it began. Nonetheless, there are two main components that we do know needed to happen in order for life to have gotten started. First, there must have been a genetic molecule, something like DNA or RNA, capable of passing along blueprints for making proteins. And second, Earth must have had access to the essential elemental ingredients of life, such as carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. But even if we don't know how life began, we do have some nifty theories. So welcome back to Curiosity 180, and let's talk about it. The most common theory is that life began purely by accident. This theory is called the primordial soup theory, which suggests that life began in a pond or ocean. These soups were filled with amino acids, the building blocks of proteins, which would eventually evolve into the first species on Earth. These molecules would have collided at random for millions of years until the perfect combination just magically happened in order to spark the creation of life. However, the chances of life just spontaneously creating itself doesn't seem likely. Can you imagine how lucky we are if all of this was just an accident? But there is another more intriguing theory called panspermia which states that life could have originated somewhere else and is being spread from planet to planet by asteroids. The asteroids would have carried genetic material or some component of genetic material. 
If met with ideal conditions on a new planet, the bacteria would become active and the process of evolution begins. This theory is supported by two main facts. First, we know it is possible for rocks from other planets to reach Earth. In fact, there are rocks from Mars on Earth. Second, we know life can actually survive through space. Tardigrades, a microbe, are notable for being the most durable of known organisms. They are able to survive extreme conditions that would be fatal to nearly all other known life forms. But these are just theories, whether you believe them or not. Life has already started, so enjoy it, and watch more Curiosity 180 videos. What you're going to see now is a brief animation of a theory for the origin of life developed by Mike Russell and Bill Martin. The origin of life on Earth is to be sought before 3.8 billion years ago because sedimentary rocks of that age contain evidence for life, but after 4.2 billion years ago because geochemists tell us that that's when the first water was stably existing on Earth. Now, we're not going to be looking at warm little ponds of the time that Darwin had in mind because at that time, late heavy bombardment, land was not a pleasant place to be. Things were certainly more stable at the bottom of the ocean. And since their discovery in 1978, people have thought that maybe these black smoker type of hydrothermal vents might be important for the origin of life. Now, we think that a different kind of vent discovered by Deb Kelly and her co-workers in 2000 called lost city type events or off-ridge vents might be more relevant for the origin of life because their chemical conditions are more conducive to life, not quite as hot and maybe a little bit richer in hydrogen. Now, the geochemical differences between these two types of systems are schematically illustrated here. On the right, you can see the black smoker kind of vent with the uh, sitting directly above a magma chamber. Now that magma is 1,200 degrees, and that's why the water coming out of black smokers is about 350 degrees. That's, we think, too hot for the origin of life. On the left, you can see the Lost City kind of vent, and there we think that this, the, the water coming out of the Lost City kind of vent is much cooler, around 70 to 90 degrees, and we think a very important process going on that's been characterized in Lost City called serpentinization is going to be important for the origin of life. That's schematically represented here. We've got water molecules being reduced by inexhaustible reserves of iron II in the Earth's crust to molecular hydrogen that leaves the vent in the effluent as these little white balls along with sulfur shown in yellow. Now at the vent ocean interface, the sulfur precipitates iron II and nickel shown here in black and green to give us transition metal sulfides. These mineral precipitates will have two very important functions, catalytic and compartmentalization. Their catalytic ability is going to be shown in the next blend in here. And transition metal sulfides have long been known to have um, very important catalytic abilities in organic chemistry. Here, hydrogen dependent reduction of carbon dioxide to carbon monoxide, similar to what we see today in an enzyme called carbon monoxide dehydrogenase, maybe being uh, connected up via methyl groups or methyl sulfide to acetyl thioesters, which we think are very important compounds. The most central compound in all metabolism is an acetyl thioester, acetyl-CoA, and we think that that has a reason. Now, the compartmentalization function is shown here. These little green dots are RNA precursors and amino acids here polymerizing into RNA-like molecules to give us the RNA world and little peptides floating around there, but not genetically encoded ones. For that, you need the ribosome and the genetic code, and that we have right here. Every other theory for the origin of life has to solve this problem. We solve it here. But within these self-forming inorganic compartments, the contents of which then give rise to the common ancestors of the eubacteria and the archaeobacteria, which we think were acetogens and methanogens respectively. They make the transition to the free living state, divide and populate the earth in its Darwinian evolution among prokaryotes since then.